Welcome and hello. Today's topic is the burrito supreme of immunity. I mean, the Supreme Court asking questions so they can weigh in on presidential immunity. This took place on Thursday, April 25th, 2024. Let's start with why is this case even coming up? There are federal indictments against the former president, Donald Trump. There are four indictments that have multiple charges each that were brought forward. At first, these were presented to the D.C. court, and it was determined that there was no presidential immunity that extends beyond civil cases into the realm of criminal charges. And as such, the prosecutors were free to go forward with their case. Naturally, Trump and his team did not like this, so they appealed and sought to get the case in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, also biding them time, getting a delay. The U.S. Supreme Court agreed to hear the case, but only on the question of whether presidents and former presidents by extension have absolute immunity from criminal prosecution so far as they allege whatever act has was done is essentially an official act. The four violations that Donald Trump is accused of are important to know because they put in perspective what is it that the Supreme Court is actually going to be talking about is immune here. So the first one is conspiracy to defraud the United States. The second, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. The third, obstruction of the obstruction of and attempt to obstruct and an official proceeding and conspiracy against rights. If you're sitting there and thinking that the problem was January 6 riots, freedom of speech, or I don't know, a picnic, whatever you want to call it from your side of the political spectrum, then you are grossly mistaken. But let's review just to be sure. The indictment alleges this all started on November 14th, 2020, shortly after Trump found out he lost the 2020 election. Reading through the indictment, you can see why this is a serious situation. But what is the prosecution claiming to have evidence for in these allegations? And likely do, after all, because federal prosecutors rarely go to court if they do not think they have the evidence to prove a case. But for now, these are just all alleged crimes. And I'm summarizing the points. One, using false claims of election fraud to get state legislators and election officials to subvert the legitimate election results and change electoral votes for Biden to Trump. Unknowingly baseless, fraudulent Claim. Two, organized a fraudulent slate of electors in seven states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, attempting to mimic the procedures that legitimate electors were supposed to follow, cast fraudulent votes, sign certificates falsely, and transfer their false votes to be counted. Three, attempting to use the power and authority of the Justice Department to conduct shame election crime investigations and send letters to targeted states claiming falsely that they had identified significant concerns that may impact the outcome, and then have them present the fraudulent electors as valid alternatives illegitimately. Four, enlist the vice president to use his role at the certification process on January 6th to alter the election results. Through all the means above and pressuring him through the false claim that the VP could even do this during the certification process. 5. As violence ensued on January 6th, halting the certification process, Trump attempted to exploit the disruption by redoubling his efforts to levy false claims of election fraud and convince members of Congress to further delay the certification. Again, unknowingly false claims. All these claims include the co-conspirators mentioned in the indictment in this conspiracy to do all these things. The indictment goes over the evidence the prosecution will use to prove these charges and look for a video where I'll read through that entire thing. But for this one, this is all we need to know. So here's the proposal from Trump's lawyer in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. D. John Sawyer opens with speaking about how, without presidential immunity from criminal prosecution, there can be no presidency as we know it. 
end quote. I won't lie. It feels initially like a compelling argument. I'm a liberal, so I think most people are good and have good intentions. It feels right to think that people need protection, especially in a high-profile position like the President of the United States. Bauer continues with his three main points that get brought up again and again throughout the Supreme Court's questioning. Again, we're talking about the indictments that I talked about above. One, this protection, the criminal immunity that he's pushing, guarantees an energetic presidency, one that is capable of bold and brave actions. Two, it protects against coercion. If the threat of prosecution were always looming, after all, they could be blackmailed or extorted, and we don't want that for the president. Three, it's tradition. Past presidents haven't been under this level of criminal liability, and for 234 years, there's been no prosecutions like this of any kind, despite what he would argue, things like the indictment or orders that would countermand immunity, like ordering drone strikes to kill people, having happened. Throughout the questioning, it becomes a little more clear. Bauer is really focused in on the what-if scenario of a president who would be not immune to criminal prosecution for any act that is even alleged to be official. Every president would be chilled from operating as a checks and balance against the other branches of government, wouldn't do what was necessary in the times of war or foreign disputes, and would be more susceptible to exploitation of just about anybody, but especially Congress. He instead proposes a process, impeach the president while they are actively the president, then go after them. Fail to do the former, you give up the capacity to do the latter. So if you fail to impeach the president while they're actively sitting president, no matter what the crime is, you can't go after them once they're no longer president. The best counters to these from the justices were questions that poked holes in the process as clearly not acceptable or within the grounds of what we understand as checks and balances to be, or even reasonable. If a president could just jail or assassinate their opponent without the threat of prosecution, then why wouldn't they? Telling of nuclear launch codes? No problem. Sauer's counter to these concerns were that you could impeach them, but the counter from the justices was, how? If they are not criminally liable, they can't be impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors. They essentially wouldn't be breaking the law, even if they did something like murder their rival or order others to do so. Thus, no impeach impeachable offense. A lot more came up from other cases. They talked about civil liability, like Fitzgerald versus Nixon, where it was determined presidents do have absolute immunity from civil lawsuits, because otherwise everyone and their brother would sue them for everything and delay official federal processes. Sauer also talked a lot about clear notice from Congress being necessary in any situation to say that any law could affect the president. I think this was well shot down by historical implications of needing to say pardon Nixon. If he hadn't committed something, how could he have been held liable and why the pardon? And that plain reading of laws apply to all people, especially the big ones like preventing people's votes from counting or, you know, murdering someone. Sauer's strongest argument came in, especially if you consider that it took over the entire proceedings, about how official acts granted by the Constitution needed to be protected from congressional interference, interference like prosecution, in order to maintain the checks and balances system set up structurally within the Constitution. But he also needs this to go to the absolute limits, as in, any even slightly official act would need to be removed from the record, couldn't be used for evidence, etc., which puts some of the justices into a predicament. If you sold an ambassadorship for a million dollars as president, then Sauer was proposing you couldn't bring to court the evidence of the ambassadorship piece, just the million dollars. And then it wouldn't really be a crime, now would it? Because you didn't do a quid pro quo as far as the record is concerned. You just accepted a million dollars. For what? Courts can't know. That was the sticky ground we left him in as we moved on to the prosecution or the non-Trump side. Michael Dreben stepped up. His introduction seemed less strong than Sauer's, 
I think this is because you can't put it on a t-shirt and it's not as bold, right? Dower really invoked a lot of the American spirit of run forward and be fearless. Well, Dreamin was the guy telling us to put on a jacket before we go out and play in the snow. His, intro his introduction summarized his points as such. One, there's no historical precedent of presidents having absolute criminal immunity. Two, there's nowhere in the Constitution that textually, textually has this written. And three, if the president had absolute immunity, this would break the checks and balances principles within the Constitution. Throughout the questioning from the justices, it became clear that Dreben did believe there were some powers that the president had which the Congress could not interfere with and could not be prosecuted for basically any reason. Small grouping of powers, as specifically mentioned in Article 2, pardon, veto powers, appointments, and a small few others. All of which, since they're granted by that Article 2 in the Constitution, really wouldn't be subject to prosecution or investigation. Moreover, he argued that the president has a lot of structural defenses from falling into the chilling process of being prosecuted for every single thing they may do, like having the attorney general at their disposal to weigh in on legal functions, Article 2 powers that can't be prosecuted against, and public authority. This idea, for instance, if a president ordered a drone strike against a foreign combatant, that this is a lawful act when that person is an identified, say, terrorist. And thus, the federal murder statute wouldn't apply as it isn't an unlawful killing. And that there was historical backing for this from the OLC, which is the Office of Legal Counsel. And he mentioned quite a few different tests that could be used from prior decisions and cases that would be helpful in determining all of this official act versus private act stuff, but leaned heavily on not offering absolute immunity because there were already plenty of protections from overreaching prosecutions in the Constitution, and the dangers of offering that absolute immunity were great and severe. The justices pushed back on these two, resolving that the special protections that Dreben was talking about were more or less immunities, and went through a series of questions and hypotheticals to find out how various acts could be interpreted, prosecuted, etc. Dreben's best defense came up in response to these questions. He dove into nuanced discussions, talked about how no person was above the law, the historical precedents for that, and stuck to his differentiation of the special protections versus immunities, as immunities always provided protection regardless of your goal, be it legal or illegal. And the special protections only protected you from official goals, not private ones. This was also, unfortunately, his weakest time. His argument is very nuanced and very steeped into the law and historical understanding of that law. It's easy to want to side with something clear, black and white, and easily implemented. Dreben's process, to be fair, has been the one in place all along, and as big questions have cropped up, they have come to the Supreme Court to be handled in that nuanced way. This all wrapped up with some concerns from some justices that an open ticket to commit whatever crime desired for entirely personal reasons should have prosecutory options and should the person be found guilty, appropriate punishments applied, especially in cases with allegations like these where the former president is accused of breaking our fundamental trust that our votes count, that our process as historical as it is works, and if all the evidence they've proposed in the indictment is accurate, the very person who shouted about voter fraud all along was the person attempting to defraud the United States to the point of not having a fair election. Because why? He wanted more power, a totally personal gain, and not within the realm of official acts. That is serious. The only check here is this case right now. And if they're not allowed to go forward to actually bring that case against Trump, whether Trump is innocent or guilty of the crimes, the next president, or even the current one, can literally order SEAL Team 6 to kill their opponent and be immune to law and order. That's pretty scary. And it's not an overstatement, as that kept coming up. We'll have to wait to see until May 9th, when the court reconvenes, and we'll all learn more. Do they have a decision? it will most certainly mark history with either the prosecution of a former president being able to move forward 
or the American people will never again be able to impeach a sitting president, let alone charge one for any criminal activity they did while in the office, regardless of whether or not it was strictly for personal gain. Stay tuned for part two. It's going to be a doozy.